So again, good evening, everyone. Yeah. I um, I hope you're all well. And uh, thank you for joining us on the third third webinar of the, the winter webinar series that we've been running throughout the winter. Um, it's been really successful so far and people have really enjoyed it. And we're really glad that we to get Jenny and Al along for, for this evening uh, in the lead up to Christmas. So tonight, Jenny and Al are going to be chatting about all the things in between the giant adventures that, uh, that well, these two do really like because it's not all about doing these big big epics and waiting for for the good weather or the summer you can always do these sort of little local adventures whether it's in the evenings after work or at the weekends just squeezing them here and there you don't have to do much or go far to to get that sense of adventure so i'll i'll hand over to, to jenny and al and they'll they'll tell you what it what it's all about and what you can do and and where you can find adventure in between Samuel, oh. before you before you Jenny launches into an, uh, her introduction, can you fix the chat so that everyone can ask the questions? Yeah. It seems to be disabled for people. Of course. Thank you. Come on, Jenny, tell us something amazing. I've I've got the Q and A app right on my screen and just realised how bad I am at multitasking. <laughs> I'm like, poor Helen, her chat's disabled. Okay, I'm going to put it off. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Last time Al and I were chatting together at the big shakeout over the summer, it was about absolutely giant adventures of cycling around the world. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's going to be a very, very different chat tonight. Um, and a really important one, because I think it's easy to get hung up on these massive adventures that we do. But actually, we don't see that to make them so cool and epic. It takes like the smaller, more localised um, adventures to that, that sort of get you to that start line. That's what I always find. Um, so yeah, tonight we're going to be going through how we managed to like protect time over winter for our adventures because it's definitely a little bit harder, a bit colder, um, and it can be a bit grim to make yourself go outside sometimes. So pull that apart a little bit. Um, and also just really highlighting how important it is to like celebrate our local spaces and um, what adventuring we can do close to home. So uh, as the chat seems to be working, please just throw any questions, comments that you can in there. And um, Al and I will be keeping an eye on them and answering them as we go. So don't feel like you have to wait till the end. Uh, please interrupt us at any point. I love yeah. seeing all the names coming in. We got, I first spot the first one uh, from Stephen from Shelby, Ohio. So we some winter snowshoeing and working at the ski slope there's one to make all us londoners feel jealous <laughs> <laughs> so jenny what 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 what's a winter adventuring look like to you at the moment mm, so i'm up in the highlands of scotland up in inverness and we are just coming into a two-month period where we've got uh, between six and eight hours of daylight and uh, when it's grim weather, then that goes down quite significantly. So it was a little bit daunting thinking about that in September, sort of October time, thinking, oh, yeah, I really enjoy the bright nights and how much you can fit into your day. But now they're here. I am leaning into the darkness and absolutely loving it. Everything sort of changes um, up in the in the Highlands. I find you eat very different food. It's all about like staying warm, cutting wood, uh, staying cosy, and then fitting in that that sort of adventure so you don't just turn in, turn into a total hermit. So I rely a lot on my community uh, on my community in the Highlands. I um, got a good bunch of um, pals, but they're all sort of centered around Velocity Mountain Bike Club, um, like Highland Hill Runners go out every, you know, every Thursday and these sort of real community uh, places that you can go along and like you'll find sort of 20 or 30 other people going off into the, off into the dark woods with head torches on is really, really satisfying and definitely makes you get out the door when it's, yeah, when it's not that appealing to. What about yeah. you, Al? Very different. Yeah, well, I, the um, something you mentioned there uh, reminded me of a book I read a while ago. I can't remember the name of the person, but it's called Wintering, I think. And it was a really good book about how over winter time, just almost allowing yourself to not 
feel that you have to be continually doing crazy stuff like you are throughout the summer and to just accept the natural ebbs and flows of the of the annual cycle so i find that's quite a helpful thing um i uh, i um mostly find that in winter time i just do runs running's what i seem to like doing the most um i'm rubbish at riding my bikes always fall off in the mud so uh evening evening runs with the headlights on i really enjoy Yeah, absolutely. And it's that one is when it's so difficult to leave the house and then you go and then you just see all the lights running towards you and you think, oh, OK, I'm not crazy. There's like all these other crazies that are right with me, too. Yeah, yeah, lovely. I'm seeing in the uh, so the books by Catherine May. Um, so far in all of this chat, my most impressive winter adventure I've seen is Rob. He's doing the Arctic spine race. That's uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty epic. Is that one that will appeal to you, Jenny? Wow, absolutely. I mean, is that the spine race in the UK or is that actually in the Arctic? To be honest, I don't know, but it had the word Arctic and spine in and both of those things sounded harder than I intend to be doing this weekend. Oh, in Arctic <laughs> Sweden. Arctic Sweden, apparently it is. We need, I need to fire me from this webinar and get Rob Brooks to do a tough guy winter podcast. That sounds much more impressive. Um oh. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, Rob, we want we want more information. 293 miles along the Kungsleden. Wow. Very impressive. Amazing. I have actually signed up to do the Keltman. I find it really, really good at this time of the year. Like I'm very like I get quite um, motivated by having some goals um, that are especially when they're quite far away and they're not <laughs> and they're not just around the <laughs> corner. And um, they're my favourite type. And so I signed up and to the Keltman, which is an Ironman, extreme Ironman, very local. So it's like less than an hour away. It's up in Torridon on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and it's a swim in the sea, a three and a half kilometre swim in the sea. I can't currently swim more than a few lengths of breaststroke. So I'm doing shark training uh, a couple of mornings a week with my pal and she's teaching me how to swim like a shark uh, and that's been great that's been super good is that indoor swimming or outdoor swimming at the moment indoor swimming because i am extremely bad um but i do go outdoor dipping yeah so how do you I swim don't... like a shark um um fast and efficient oh I th I, okay i thought it was some sort of official training technique well it is swim like a shark okay cool well, like, i'm impressed that's, that's what you're aiming for yeah there's it's not an actual training technique no it's just our motivation um, okay. and morning. where cool. do you find out about all these fun things to do such a good point sometimes that's from kate in the q a and uh i'm like that sometimes think how are people finding out about these amazing things um I, that's a local event for me so i first aided on it quite a few times um because it's up in torrid and so that's how i know about it but as soon as you start speaking to people like if you go and do one event kate and then you start speaking to people about it or one adventure um and just like start blabbing about it you will soon find out about other events because people just you know it just sort of sparks off um all this sort of yeah stories yeah. especially if you try and show off about something tough you've done because then someone will say oh but what about so and so and offer you the thing that's tougher than that so do you know do you know the norseman triathlon yes it's like the count man have yeah. you done it no, I can't swim either. But you have to run up a big hill in that one, don't you? So in the chat here, another very impressive thing. Chris Lansley's just finished his five years worth of doing a bivvy a month, which is fantastic. I did that for one year. Um, and uh, it's what's really interesting about doing something like Chris has done is by embracing the seasons is really noticing how... The, the, the seasons change which sounds like a ridiculous thing to say but for example when you go in a bivy bag in june that sounds like a lovely thing to do in the hills but you basically get zero sleep because it's completely light whereas in the winter time although it's cold you get epic amounts of sleep it's a great time to go camping you can justify going to bed at about 6 p.m and you can justify not waking up until about 9 a.m which is pretty much my dream thing to do uh, <laughs> these days so yeah well done chris that's an impressive thing to do
is so cool. And uh, we've been doing that, but using the moon. So not quite bidding out uh, every month, but we use the moon and uh, me and a couple of pals, anytime that we're all in Inverness, we'll go out and we'll have a fire on the beach and we'll go for a dip in the very cold water. And you're right, in the summertime, it's like grey and everyone's free and easy. And then it gets to this time of year and all of a sudden people are a little bit more reluctant about saying that they're home. I think I think the moon's a really good um, example, actually, of how in the winter time, in particular, it can be really good to schedule in some adventure type things because it's it's very easy to not get round to doing stuff. So last year, I, I scheduled in a full moon activity. So every full moon, once a month, I would go out and do something: a run, a hike, a walk, a swim. Um, on the night of the full moon and that was great because it got me out doing 12 evening things that I enjoyed them all but I probably wouldn't have bothered with a few of them and again uh, similar to with uh, Chris and the bivvy it's fascinating the, the different experience between a January full moon experience and a June one and then not necessarily better or worse but spectacularly different um Sarah's Sarah's oh. recommending a book that's encouraged her to swim, but you put a Goodreads link, so I don't know what the book is. But Sarah, if you can tell us that, I'll give a shout out for that book that's encouraged you to get out swimming. Mm, a shout out, and I'll buy it. I need all the help I can get, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, there's a, a question here from Kate, which is I think everyone was going to get could be relevant for everyone, which is how do you keep warm in extreme? winter conditions without carrying masses and masses of clothing well my answer is I always wear outkit clothing uh Jenny what's your answer <laughs> <laughs> sorry who's logged on Dave yep I always wear outkit clothing too <laughs> 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 uh, honestly you I just party a lot of kit over winter you just do you know your bike packing bags and um, uh, you know I use I try and avoid panniers as much as possible only because I carry so much kit when I have them um, but over winter it's just like my go-to when I'm going off on adventures on the bike because really and um, like Al said unless you're you know you've got so much hours of darkness that often you're lying down for a lot longer or you're sitting still for a lot longer and to do that then yeah you need good cozy kit. Beyond all the obvious sort of kit answers the recommendation I would suggest are pogies which are likes of like mini sleeping bags that go on your handlebars and your hands go in them. They're called pogies. And I use them when I cycle through Siberia in the middle of winter and they are the best thing for cold hands on the bike. So yeah, I uh, highly recommend it. Uh, the book, the winter swimming book is called The Winter Swimming, The Nordic Way Towards a Healthier and Happier Life by Susanna Soberg. So there's a book for any winter wild swimmers out there. Hey. Amazing. Yeah, pogies are great. And my go-to, my favourite piece of uh, winter kit, but I actually wear them all the time, even in summer, is um, dying trousers that I invested in a couple of years ago. And pff, they are game changers, absolute game changers. What I think Outkit need to um, need to invent, seeing as I'm talking to 400 people here, is some windproof underpants for winter running. That's what I need. Mmm. I used to have to improvise with my buff, but we don't need to think too much about this. <laughs> no, I think we need a demonstration, Al. Show us. <laughs> I would be cancelled before the end of the Zoom call. <laughs> I'm mostly wondering <laughs> what size your buff is, if you're able to use it as a windproof. Well, given the size of what everything else is when I'm blooming cold, the buff does the job perfectly well. <laughs> oh, my God. Right then, moving swiftly on. <laughs> we are we are celebrating a bit tonight, Al, aren't we? Are we? Why is that? Are we? Oi! Woohoo! Has anybody yes. here got hold of Al's latest book, Local? Which currently... Let us know if you have. That book is not yet published to the whole universe. It's currently only available on my website, which I'm really enjoying doing. Oh, Mike says it's on pre-order. If you've got it on pre-order, that is good news because, uh, yeah, you can get it on pre-order on lots of places. So you can get it on my website, hopefully in time for Christmas. Thanks for the plug, Jenny. That is excellent to know. And I'm really enjoying it. Very 
funny. Oh, funny? Really? I thought it was depressing. Oh, well, I've not maybe got to the depressing bits yet. I'm quite a slow reader. Um, okay. First couple of pages were quite funny. <laughs> first couple of pages. That, that's the sort of um, research reading I do before interviewing someone. I read the first two pages and the last two pages and then try and cobble together an intelligent interview. So let me hear you ask me some questions about the first two pages of my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what I think is really interesting about it? Okay, so local, I mean, I'm not going, I don't need to tell everyone what your book's about. Why don't you tell your everyone what your book's about? Because I'll... I'm, I'm too busy trying to sell my book to everyone in the chat now. Um, all right, okay. So base, all right. Oh, no, actually, I will. And also, more important in my book, Marmot make windproof underpants. Come on, Alki, you've got to get on the game here. Right, sorry, back to the task in hand, which is me trying to flog everyone my book. So what I've, I've spent a year doing is exploring the one ordnance survey map that I live on. And wherever you, wherever we live in the UK, you can get the map that you happen to live on. Or if you're a fancy pants, you can pay and get a customised map with your house positioned wherever you want. Ideally in the middle, but if you put it right in the middle, it gets wrecked by the creases. Put it slightly off the middle. These, by the way... Better even than windproof underpants or my book, I think is a brilliant Christmas present to buy for people. The, the local map of where they live to try and encourage them to get out. So I've spent a year exploring just the map that I live on, going out once a week to explore one grid square in great depth. I see you've got uh, the map on the wall behind you. Is that is that your local map? And how it well do you know it? Map. I am here. I am here. And yeah, I've got loads of contour lines just like heading west. It's not one map though, it's three maps all put together. But um, yeah, uh, it, so it sounded quite extreme. When I first heard that you were doing that, I was like, God, like one map, you know, really challenged me. Um, but then when you look back at the things that you've done over the years, like I first came across you when you did Bothy, Mountain Bikes and Bothy Nights, is that right? Um, and that film was excellent when you'd got sleeper train up from London and with your mountain bike back in the days when there were bargain berths and everyone could afford to get on the sleeper and have a snooze. And uh, you came up to the Highlands. And at the same time in my life, I was getting that sleeper down with my son to London and we were having like city adventures, you know, we'd have our picnic packed and go off to London for like two days. Um, and so it was like, yeah, it really, really captured me. But then you went on obviously to do micro adventures and, um, and then it seems, so it seems to be like, a progression for you like of like almost an ob an obvious progression um although a lot of us would be like what is that what it feels yeah. like yeah my adventure seems to be getting ever smaller and involving ever more coffees and ever fewer miles and hard work um um so yeah i guess that it has got small small but when i started this i was worried that it was going to be too claustrophobic too constraining and too boring um, and I see in the comment there's a couple of people already uh, saying that uh, they can't do uh, uh, my my map has a lot of built up areas alas um, and when I look at the map of you where you live behind I'm just filled with envy I can see there's locks and there's contour lines and forests and I live just outside a big city and I would um, I would love to have the sort of wilderness that you have so actually the the book that I've been writing is about a fairly urban experience and there's a lot of towns in there. Um, but weirdly, I actually came to really enjoy the weeks when I got sent to a random sort of urban kind of area, um, mostly because it just required a mind shift of choosing that wherever I go this week, chosen by my random number generator, wherever I go, I will be enthusiastic and curious about it and i will do my best to find nature and interesting things um and and i think the fact actually that i live on a fairly moderately built up slightly sort of edge of town boring farmland area made it a more interesting experience in some ways i mean if you went to 52 grid squares on that map behind you you'd have 52 lovely mountain experiences but they wouldn't be as varied i don't think as my slightly scuzzy map of graffiti and fly tipping and burned out cars 
Yeah, I love that word. I read that today when the cyclist from London had come out and met you and you asked why he was there and he said, I just quite like scuzzy area. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come to my neighbourhood to find some scuzzy areas. <laughs> um and yeah that that is the thing isn't it it's like so different and I think that was that's one of the appealing things about it is like finding that yeah finding the adventure in the in the urban what were you most worried about do you think which it was it boredom that you were worried like getting into it was it that you wouldn't be able to find get into the mindset yeah I was worried that what sounded like quite a fun quirky little idea when I had it would in fact actually be just quite boring and quite repetitive. And I personally would just get sick of it and want to go off and do something a bit bigger and more varied. So that was absolutely my my worry yeah. at the start. Um, but, but then actually by the end of the year, my worry was more along the lines of, I'm, I'm writing a book about claiming to be an authority about this map. And yet I've only seen 52 grid squares. There's 400 grid squares on every map. There's years and years of exploration left before I can see that. Um, and that, and yeah, so, and I think because it's just one kilometer square at a time, it's quite manageable around the constraints of busy real life. And I think therefore a good thing to start in these dark winter months when perhaps you, we're not up for the more ambitious things or the more epic mountain type things. So see when you're saying um, about the mindset, so like you're going in with this mindset of like today is going to be an adventure and you referred to it in the book like if, as if you were abroad, as if you were on holiday and that you would like connect with people as if as if it, it was going to be an adventure, you were already there with it. So what what like what were you classing as adventures when you were out there? What was your days consisting of? Was it purely exploring where, where you've been quite physical, like any student staff um so uh at the risk of disappointing you two pages into my book um i can't i can't honestly claim that it felt like an adventure the whole experience and i certainly can't claim that it involved any endurance <laughs> at all um it was a very very slow experience um and um it was about it was about slowing down more than I've ever done before and paying more attention than I've ever done before. Now, I'm not sure if Jenny has just disappeared from the universe or I've just disappeared from the universe. Jenny's back. It was just when you said that, you know, it, well, there was no adventure to come. <laughs> you just quit. I was like, do you know what, Al? I've got stuff to do. Yeah. I, thought, I thought you'd gone off to get a copy of Coffee First, Then the World, which would make an excellent Christmas gift. Do you have a copy of that to show us? Wouldn't it? No, I don't actually. Oh, what? Uh, Come on. I know. I know. I don't have a copy at hand, but I will have copies for sale for Christmas. This yes. weekend. Yes. Um, excellent. <laughs> it is. And like, I I like I know you're joking about reading the first two pages of your book. I have read a bit more than that. Um, and there was a bit that really stood out and I wondered what you were getting from it. So in every chapter, you started with a quote from, from somebody and they're really, really good. Um, and I thought at first, I was like, why? Wow, I wonder if I was getting inspiration from these books and from these people or actually, is it more that he was doubting what he was doing and if it was, you know, because you talk a lot about that at the beginning, about doubting whether this is going to make a book, whether it's going to make an adventure. And was it almost like a bit of backup for you? Like, oh, no, these people are, are, are saying this like along the way. No, it was no, it was the it was the former, really. So what, what I do each week is I go out to this grid square uh, with my camera and a notebook um, and I took the camera as a way to really make myself slow down because I guess a bit like you, I'm quite hyperactive and my temptation is always just think, oh, I'll just zoom around here really fast. Then I'll go ride my bike somewhere. I'll just do stuff fast. And what I wanted to try to do here was to counter that and to really make myself slow down and accept that this small little area that I was in today was enough. And that was all I that was sufficient if I paid enough attention to it so I took lots of photos um, and I took lots of notes and then when I cut write all these notes I'd come home later and start googling all sorts and that led me off down all sorts of rabbit warrens of websites and books and things but yeah so it's, it's been a really really interesting experience but I can't honestly claim it was an adventure but it did feel like a journey I guess yeah 
There's a question here about, sorry, a question here about uh, the Dartmoor 365 book, which is a very similar sort of idea of uh, Dart the Dartmoor map covers 365 grid squares. So that's a one grid square for every day of the year in a book. So um, what I, I what, what I think is nice is that anyone can do this wherever they live and it will be a really similar but different experience for everyone. There's a lot of love coming in for your audio, for your book here, Jenny, in, uh, in the comments. And people seem yeah. to be claiming that you're not as much of a shameless marketeer as me. So let me move from my shameless marketing to ask you about some of your winter adventures, because you actually do adventurous stuff uh, in the winter time. So I'm not I'm not quite finished yet. Oh, oh, I'm come on. Not. OK, go no, on then. No, no. Because <laughs> you, you out there, like you ask this question a lot and anything I've seen you writing about local and it's you pose the question, is one map enough for a lifetime of adventure? And after a year of adventuring on that, what's what's the outcome? What are you thinking? Yeah, is a single map enough exploration for an entire lifetime? Right, I sort of stole that quote from a fantastic little adventure running film by Ricky Gates called Of Fells and Hills about hill running in the Lake District. If you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. And in that film, he, so Ricky Gates is an American runner and he comes over and he interviews all the sort of usual Lake District running characters who run around, do the Bob Graham and stuff. And by the end of the film, Ricky, who runs all over the world, he's quite jealous of these guys. And he's and he says, geez, maybe, you know, these guys have basically been running these same hills their whole life. Maybe one mountain range is enough for an entire lifetime. And that, that phrase has always stuck in my mind of the deeper you go into your local mountain range, um, the the um the more the the more that it gives. So I kind of stole that idea for the map. And I did find similar that from starting out thinking this is quite boring, the more that I started to get into it and pay attention to it, the more I realized that I didn't really know that much of it. And there was actually so much that was still out there. So I decided to I decided to try to finish the book by doing uh something that was at least a tiny bit adventurous, which was yeah. to go and cycle through every single grid square on the whole map. And I think that would be a fantastic winter challenge adventure for, for anyone to give a go to, is to try and ride through every single grid square on your map. It becomes quite a crazy plate of spaghetti, wiggly sort of route. Um, and it ended up being about a sort of 300 mile route done over a few days. And I love the fact that then I just felt like I was on a normal cycling adventure, like when you're cycling across a country. You, know, you get up in the morning, you cycle all day. And then you put your tent up at night and you cycle all day, just like in a big adventure. But here I was just going round and round and round and round, round my neighborhood. And here, even after a year exploring this map and many years doing micro adventures and going out cycling on it, still, I was continually going through places that I'd never set eyes on in my life before. So, um, yeah, I think cycling through every grid square on a map is a really good thing for people to try. Um, I love that that you went out and then rode through every uh, every grid square, and you must have felt so connected, like to the places, seeing them from all different angles, seeing like where you'd been at different times of the year. Yeah, it was really nice because I, like everyone, I guess I've my, you know, if 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 I had I've got one hour to go for a run, I know I can go on that place. If I've got three hours to go for a bike ride, I go and do that, and I'd end up being with just a few things I do regularly. And this was a really nice way of me thinking, oh, look, this is how that bike ride links onto that bike ride. I never knew about this little bridle way before. So yeah, it's been really good for discovering more, more sort of gravel trails and things to ride. Nice. Um, and are you sticking to your map? That's the burning question. Are you just committing to the map or are you going further afield now that the book's written? <laughs> I, I think I'll try I think I'll do both you know I will um keep paying closer attention to my local land and it certainly made me appreciate it more than I did before uh, but yeah I'm also keen to hit, head to the hills I haven't been to the Scottish hills since the day before lockdown and I seriously miss the hills wow. wow that's a long time isn't it um and another thing that struck me was obviously in Scotland we are absolutely blessed with the right to roam um and you know we can go wherever we want but did that cause any problems with like when you were out, when you were out in yeah. The years? yeah so the the right to roam is an is a sort of issue that i've been mildly interested in for a bunch of years but to be honest never fussed about that much because throughout all my micro adventuring 
time of bivy bagging stuff i just basically sleep wherever i want so i've kind of just ignored it and thought ah it'd be nice to have a right to roam but i'm just going to go where i want anyway and it didn't really bother me but this year when i was starting to go around i it just struck me how much of my map was theoretically off limits like every week was no entry do not come here private keep out woodlands hills just empty areas it's not it's not about um walking th wanting to walk through crop fields or through farmyards or disturb people it's just empty countryside there's someone saying i can't go in and that really started to get my back up and increase and a lot of the time when i was out on my map i didn't really see anybody out and about and i think a lot of these issues sort of roll and spin together you know the the less that we are have access to the land the less the fewer people who go out to to spend time out there and therefore the less interest anyone pays in nature and so the more nature gets wrecked without anyone doing anything to fix it and you get all these mental health and physical health uh negative spirals but if we can somehow get a way where more people can spend more time outside more often then they'll hopefully start to care for it and treat it more responsibly and then you get some positive feedback loops going so yeah i became quite passionate about the the right to roam during my year of not being allowed to roam around the map that i live on yeah yeah i bet um <clears throat> i find that you know i did a lot of youth work in the, bef like before i did cycling full time and uh i did i ran an outdoor education um, program with young people like 14 to 16 year olds and we it was so important to take them onto like the local munro that we can see that we could see from the school to take them on like the local mountain bike trails that we could literally see on their way home and it was like those adventures it wasn't the ones where we where, where we were getting a kick out of the bigger mountains mm -hmm. or where we were getting a kick as leaders out of the more wild places it was the places that they could see every day and it was that like planting of the seeds that that thing is out there it was like canoeing down our local river so every time they crossed the bridge they could remember that they did that and that that's the thing that they could tap into again and um yeah just see it see it so often that sort of connection with the places that that we're going to see every day and how much um i guess it just makes it a bit more part of us doesn't it like we want to care for it more we, we feel like we belong to it a bit more yeah, yeah absolutely right jenna i now need to ask you some questions because i'm how feeling feeling shameless shameless in the, the receipt receipt of all your lovely questions so tell me about the in terms of winter adventuring the dis the, the sort of similarities and the differences between something like let's say the strath puffer versus your big global bike ride so the strath puffer for people who don't know is a famous scottish 24-hour uh mountain bike race uh, how how does that stack up in your mind compared to the bigger adventures you've done? Yeah, it's the Strath Puffer, middle of winter, like middle of January. So you've got six hours of daylight max. Um, and it's like a local trail just, you know, uh, just outside Inverness, 11 mile loop. And over that weekend in the middle of January, there's over a thousand riders there and all their pit crew and the whole like 11 miles is just covered in cars and tents that are like got horns and cowbells and fires and lights mm. and it's like the biggest festival vibe um on this really really grim race that's like essentially like why on earth would you do that you're going to be riding in dark the weather is going to be you know it can be everything from snow ice like horrific rain mud um and yeah and sometimes occasionally it's glorious and everyone's really disappointed because <laughs> they've not <laughs> full puffer experience <laughs> which is it's, and are, so are you doing bad. it are you doing it solo or a pair or a team no, I have bailed out of the puffer. I've done it so many times, Al. Ah, okay. um, but this time I'm going up to commentate on it and I'm going to do all their, uh, yeah, their filming and stuff this year. So I mostly signed up to do that so nobody would sign me up to get into a team because if you live in Inverness and you have got a mountain bike, you will be signed up to the Strath Puffer without a doubt. So <laughs> what I was speaking to somebody about it today and they said, when is Al, they saw that I was reading your book and they were like, when is Al coming back to do the Strath Puffer? And she did it. Did you? Yes. Yeah, I won. Well, when you I say won. I won, 
when I say I won, it I was in the I won the we were in the mixed team, the team of four. Um, <laughs> I yeah. I did it with the, the the Howies team and we won because we had this unbelievably fast girl whose name I've forgotten, but she was insanely fast. I was rubbish, um, <laughs> but I loved it. It was fantastic. Um, but I, but uh, yeah, I did it the slightly wimpy way in the group of four. Oh, I don't know. Like I've done, yeah, you can do it in quads, pairs, solos, or now they've got groups of 10 for school kids. So as oh, they, nice. can fly, um, they can have a group of 10, which is amazing, isn't it? So there's, like sometimes there's like 10 school groups that are out there doing that. Um, but so although I've, although I've backed out this year, I think comparing it to something like Round the World, I honestly think it's that years at the Strathpuffer that does prepare you for something like Round the World, you know. Um, and I look back at Round the World and it was the most incredible incredible ride without a doubt but the journey getting to that start line the Thursday night rides with velocity that I went out on all the time you know the pals that would meet me in the morning to go out riding taking part in local events just like you know you've just built up your fitness and your resilience by by having a really good community around you and having local things to tap into. Um, so yeah, so I just think that they, they can't really compare, but I definitely wouldn't have had as much fun or been as prepared enough around the world if it wasn't for the Strathpuffer, which was actually my very first mountain bike race. It was my very first race, full stop. I'd never raced, I wasn't like a racer, because uh, I'm so competitive, I didn't think I'd ever win, so I wouldn't race anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Right. right, I'm going to ask you now. I'm going to ask you now about another adventure, which will get those of us living in urban areas quite jealous. But first of all, if those of us, those people listening, if you've got any questions, put them in the chat, please. Helen, yes, you're right. It was Hazel. She is a clothes designer and a very, very fast mountain bike racer. Um, if you know her, say hello. Uh, yeah, put some questions in the put some questions in the chat. And uh, Jenny, can you tell us about your mission to see how far you could go in a straight line? without crossing a road because where I live that would be about 150 meters well I know I was thinking about this when you were saying about like trespassing and stuff because straight lining is a thing in urban areas so um it was a few years ago now but Callum McLean I'm sure a lot of people on here will know of Callum McLean he is uh he's a lot of things but he is one of the most up for it men I have ever met <laughs> if it comes, when it comes to silly ideas and he uh got in touch to see if I wanted to try and walk in a straight line uh, the longest straight line in the UK between tarmac roads basically and it happened to be right through the Cairngorms which is like my local mountains um, so of course I said yes and hardly asked any questions I was just like mm -hmm. yeah sure sounds great and uh, had no idea what the concept of like walking in a straight line would entail um and so the following week there we set off on a on a 44 mile um hike through the Cairngorms and it was literally in a straight line so like we're following uh we had a gps you could follow a, a compass bearing but we had this gps um unit and we were literally just following that line following that bearing and that meant if it went down like it didn't matter like you know you know when you get to hill and you're like oh yeah there's the obvious path <laughs> yeah yes so yeah. you're like oh but we're not going there okay we're going on this like slightly jaunty angle mm -hmm. sort of traverse around and uh, like all oh, right okay so we're now we're going to go down into this really steep galley and sort of like clamber down it and back up again um and <laughs> it was in some parts it was just it, it was so mindless. It was like just at the beginning of the, uh, just after the A9, there was this areas that were just so dull. It was just like <laughs> nothing to see. And it was monotonous. And we were just like following this, um, following one another and being like blade of grass to the right, <laughs> just like greener bit to the left, um, trying to keep each other on track. But then we really got into it, like after a couple of days of like living on the line. So we were traveling at 
one mile an hour out there, right? It was really slow. We had really heavy packs of us. We were going nowhere fast and uh, living on this line. And um, by the end of it, like by maybe two days in, three days in, we were getting into the really chunky mountains by that point. And we were like dropping down and seeing the most incredible waterfalls that we'd never seen before. Mm. Now, I and Callum have both adventured and um, gone in like trained um like just spent so much time on bikes on skis camping with family on ethics you name it the caring gorms i thought i knew them inside out like i thought i knew every part of them and now this straight line adventure had just like led me to the coolest swim pools and waterfalls and um yeah views that i'd never seen before hills that i would have never gone up before and um, so the concept was fascinating it was like really cool but that thing that we said earlier about the comment on how do you find out about these things so when we came back now it's incredibly niche obviously walking in a straight line but when we came back from the straight line thing i found out that actually it is a thing and it's a niche that people are into and there's this guy um oh what's he called geo wizard i think he's called and he literally crosses countries um in a straight line urban areas in a straight line he is climbing up over buildings over fences <laughs> he it's like every time you think you've hit a new crazy you've got somebody coming in and they're like no 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 that is nothing wait until you see this um but, yeah. I, I, it's so cool but you know, everyone really got behind the, the idea when we got back, but people were right into like the detail of it. And so they took um, our GPS, um, uh, our GPS sort of um, tracker that we'd had out with us, which looked incredibly straight to the naked eye, like on Strava, big straight line going across the Cairngorms. And they pro put it into this computer program that they had to see how straight it was. And we had gone off by, like we'd gone off track multiple times by more than like one degree or point two degrees or something and so we actually failed our straight line challenge can you believe wow. it but we Gosh. thought that we, we thought that we were the first people to like officially do that because we couldn't find anyone that had done it and then somebody got in touch with Callum who had done it there was a group of men that had done it the other way around in the 70s I think um, and there was three of them that did it and they did it with a map and compass and uh, they just did it for the crack and he got in touch and said, hey, me and my mates actually uh, did this. But like, yeah, well done and gave us a wee story about it. So, yeah, that was that was such a cool, That's such a nice. cool thing to do. And I afterwards, I had this sort of little bit of trauma that when I would get to a path, uh, like get to a path that had a coroner on it, I would just <laughs> like, keep going. And it was really dangerous if I was on my bike. It was like, turn, remember to turn. <laughs> yes. It's interesting you talk about that guy who you're saying, so you do this idea and then there's always somebody who goes up and goes crazy, like the guy who crosses the country's doing it and he's got some yeah. mad videos of that. But equally, you can downsize everyone's adventure ideas as well. So if you hear someone doing something, you can find a smaller, shorter version that works for you. So I've just jotted, jotted down on here that I'm going to look on my map uh, tomorrow and try and find where my version of the straight line challenges on my sort of built up little thing and I'm going to go do it and I'm guessing it won't be more than two miles but it'd be quite a cool thing to do and uh, it doesn't really matter where you go it's just trying to find an excuse to go somewhere yeah um, right, we've, we've got a a, a a tech question here from Tim who says how many torches do you own what's your favorite and why that's a good niche question Wow. Uh, torches for biking or head torches? So I guess my favourite torches are my biking torches uh, because they just bring me on so many adventures um, and I use exposure and I've got um, I've got some big chunky ones on my actual bike like I think the race and I've got maybe a joystick but one of my favorite ones uh, which I can't remember the name of it but it's got a front light and a back light on it um, and so and it's got loads of different settings so it just means that like you're never stuck because the front light's really good but also if you've like forgotten your backlight or whatever it's an it's busy road then you've got that extra one so nice. that's my favorite and I don't know what my head torches are I've got a few of them that that are over the years that I've gathered up that I couldn't tell you I'll get are. ones I presume Jenny possibly actually Al now you come to see it that rings a bell 
if in doubt, just say they're out kit and they're brilliant. And then Samuel, who's watching us behind the scenes, will uh will send us a Christmas <laughs> card. Up. So Kate's asking in the Q&A, do you have any games to play while you're in the boring territory? Uh, we do countries A to Z or veggies A to Z or something like that. That's cool. Countries or veggies is cool. Um, I, I once tried to eat in a restaurant through the alphabet in London when as a way to try and get travel experiences without having to actually travel. So doing an A to Z of the world foods of London, uh, which was fantastic when I was, I was trying to learn how to make films. And we're doing really well. With this, uh, you struggle a bit on Oman and Qatar. Um, yeah, I, I spoke most. I like those sort of silly little games. That's a good idea. Mike wants to know about indoor training. I'm not. You don't strike me as an indoor sort of trainer, are you, Jenny? Do you do indoor uh, fitness training? No, if I can avoid it, as in indoor like cycling. Winter oh. training regimes. Oh, oh, oh my oh. goodness! I tell you what, I wasn't an indoor. I wasn't an indoor fitness person until I found, I didn't think I was going to say it tonight, but I'm just going to say it, uh, until I found CrossFit. And I found it two years ago, and I am not kidding. <laughs> it is like my new favourite thing. It's I'm just obsessed with it and love it and really rate it. And I went out riding on some really scary mountain bike stuff in the Alps this summer, and I was sure it was CrossFit and my new Sonder bike that made me ride much better than normal. Oh, I can't believe you've, got, you've gone two years without uh, telling me about your CrossFit. I can't believe I didn't mention it last time. Last time. Do you go to CrossFit? How do you know if someone does CrossFit? I know, right? I know. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I don't do CrossFit, but my equivalent that I do a lot of in the winter, as you can tell from my enormous muscles, is weight lifting, weight training. And a few years ago, I got really into it and I love it in the wintertime. Deadlifts and squats are good for the soul. So, um, yeah, not, not normal sort of out kit adventure type territory stuff, but I really, really love going to the gym in the winter we could this could have been such a different chat of all yeah we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a weightlifting chat some other time so sarah sarah, sarah asked a question here about uh, any recommendation for reasonably lightweight tents for bike packing with family uh now i know i've been shameless to get going on about outkit stuff in a sort of jake way but genuinely as a, a and as most neutral ways i can possibly say if someone asks me for advice in a tent and they're not looking to go to the north pole in winter time i do think the outkit ones are really lightweight and reasonably priced and what i'd recommend if you're going with you and your two kids is to buy a size up for what you need i think i'm a big fan of having a couple of hundred extra grams of weight and then a, a bigger place to sleep at night particularly in winter time and bad weather katie i've just thought of a game that we play quite a lot on okay. the, if we're if we're on the bike so you have to be like you have to have been out for a very long time for this to be uh, amusing and funny um <laughs> but to be quite like changing song words of songs into our friend's name if that makes sense so if if it was like bohemian rhapsody works really well for example and if you've got a name like if al was our friend that we were singing about we could use alistair al ali and then just like just insert that into all of the words and then your friend has to guess the song and it can go on and on and on <laughs> That's the key thing, isn't it, for a song to for for a game to go on for a very long time. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's exactly. a question a question here from Mark about: Have you ever done any vehicle based adventures? Are you into anything vehicle based? I don't think so. No. Um, no. Not for I mean, me I used either. I'm afraid. Van. I used to have a camper van, and that was sort Ooh. of vehicle based um but then i worried that i was getting soft <laughs> uh, <laughs> um tracy wants to know what happens when you get to a lock when you're straight lining you swim you swim it nice. that's what makes it so fun <laughs> <laughs> there are um, there, there is that running competition, isn't it? It's called uh, swim, run, swim, or something, where you essentially run, swim across the lake, keep running. And I think that's fantastic. You do it in pairs. Yeah, and there's a really extreme version of it up in Torridon uh, called the Ring of Sterling, 
that I have definitely got on my sights for I would need I need to get better at swimming for it though um, and it's got quite a few like remote lock swims and you run up all the highest peaks in Torridon which um, yeah it's it looks like a good one but there's lots of these like the Bob Graham round has got one hasn't haven't they um, the frog, the frog Graham. Graham yeah yeah, uh, Tracy. I know what the confusion was. Tracy thought you were with your bike. So when you were straight lining, you didn't have a bike. You were on foot. Oh no, I didn't have my bike. No, but we have we have talked about bike ones. But you know, if you got to a lock with your bike, you should definitely have a pack raft. So a few years ago, um, a bunch of us did source to sea with bikes and pack rafts. So we picked four Scottish rivers and found the very, very trickle that they started or tried to at least, um, and then followed that all the way down to the sea using our bikes and pack rafts to get there. And it was the most fabulous adventure. And it was all about just like slowing it down a bit um, because quite often like rivers in Scotland, like we could have rode them all very, very quickly. But by taking the pack rafts, it made us just, yeah, stop and take in a different different view for a bit. One of my favourite river pack rafting micro adventures in Scotland was I decided to do a source to sea because there's thousands of rivers. And my thinking was it doesn't matter what river you do, just find a river, go from source to sea and it'll be great. So I thought, right, oh, this is a good thing. I'll demonstrate this idea by going from source to sea down this river. And it was all very well and good until I got to the sea and I realised I'd gone down totally the wrong river. It wasn't, it wasn't at all the river I'd intended to go down, which I suppose proves my point. It doesn't matter where you go. <laughs> um, we've got a, a mention here for a, a thing called benchmark bagging, which is a very geeky way to explore an area. I've never heard it, but I'm up for geeky exploration. Uh, my final qu final uh, question, I think, because we're running out of time. Uh, Jenny, do you, do you ride with studded tyres? What's your winter approach? Uh, I don't ride with studded tires. I have ridden with studded studded tires, um, but I have just got micro crampons. So I would go running with little little studs, but not riding. Um, and I don't know why. I've not really needed them. Like, I've, yeah, I guess I've just I've just not really needed them for for the conditions. Although, if you do the strath puffer, then sometimes you definitely do. Yeah, I love yeah. those little mini crampons are really good for running. I spent three months cycling through Siberia in the winter time, temperatures down to minus 40, spending pretty much every day thinking, oh, I wish I'd brought the studded tyres along. So uh, but <laughs> I, I did. I did, however, have pogies. Right. Um, Jenny, it's lovely to speak to you as always. Uh, next time, let's talk mostly about CrossFit. Um, yeah, but, right. <laughs> Yeah, I've. Yeah, it's always always a pleasure to hear about your random and varied adventures. And to all you Alpkit folk and uh, general people on the webinar chat, it's, I really enjoy while we're talking away to see all these other people telling all this interesting stuff. And I often feel the sense of imposter that half the people in this chat should be doing their webinars. There's so many adventurous people doing cool stuff. So um, hello to all of you out there as well. And uh, here comes Samuel. Hello. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alan and Jenny. It's been uh, it's been really interesting to listen to both. And um, my highlights from that were well, what what I could go and do and what adventures I could do. Um, I think yeah, there's lots you can do within one map. What what I've done in the past, I once did um, in a, a town very local to me. Did a hundred miler within this town, and we tried to tick off every little street and ride down every street. And it was, it was a long day. If anyone knows, there's a few South Derbyshire people. It was Belper. So they just name dropped the uh, the town. And that was a really fun thing. And uh, for those that say they're in like urban areas, maybe that's something you could do. You, know, you could try and tick off all the streets in your, in your urban area. If you live in London, um, it's, it's, it's a good challenge. Um, and then also the straight line challenge. It looks like a great challenge to do. So uh, well, there you go. Sounds like lots of uh, lots of fun things to to keep us going this winter. But yes, th again, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone else for for joining in, for getting involved. And it's been really great to see all of your all of your comments in the chat and what what you all enjoy about doing this winter. So yeah, thank you very much, and um, we'll catch you next week for the next for the next round of the winter webinars.
Ho, ho, ho. And don't forget <laughs> everybody. Alan Dennis books. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Right, we'll sign off there. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Uh, Good night. Night, night.